a roll call. Okay, we'll start with a roll call. Okay, and uh, I'm Bob Himes. And uh, Council Member Frannich? Jim Frannich, Council. Okay, and Council Member Markley? I am here. And Mayor Kuhn? Mayor Kuhn here. Thank you. Okay, and Paul Rice? Here. And Carl DeSamis? Here. And Michelle Thomas? Here. Okay, I think that's that does it. Oh, uh, you, let's you, see. You in have terms to call of, Katrina. Oh, Katrina, I'm sorry. <laughs> the one right in the center of my screen, yeah. Uh, and Katr Katrina Knudsen. I'm here, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, why don't I move on then to the minutes of our last meeting, which was in August, if I remember correctly, the first week, first Monday in August. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Move to approve the minutes. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, minutes are approved for the August meeting. Um, the agenda that you've got in front of you there, um, there's a short-term rental um, VRBO committee discussion. The House Bill 12 1220, the Emergency Shelters and Housing Local Planning Development um, item, which Katrina is going to cover. And then the growth discussion. Uh, hopefully everybody got a chance to get the, the paper that I sent out. And uh, I'd like to discuss that whole thing and uh, see kind of where we come out on that. So. Why don't we lead off with the short-term rentals uh, slash VRBO. And uh, Katrina, I don't know who's gonna lead that discussion. I will, I'll give a jumping off point. And then I was ho hoping that we could get some council feedback on you know, action or uh, inaction, whichever the case may be. Um, but as a jumping off point, our, I wouldn't say it's a huge issue and by a huge issue, I mean, we're not hearing complaints daily, sometimes weekly, but we do, we have been hearing uh, several complaints to, uh, of the same level of complaint about short-term rentals. And the by using the term short-term rental in this discussion, I'm speaking specifically about uh, VBROs, VBROs, Airbnbs, um, something that you can rent for maybe 30 days or less. I'm not speaking of a rental property that you could rent for six months or that you would lease rather. This is more of a um, uh, purposes for lodging, not necessarily for dwelling units. So just want to kind of clarify terms here. Um, the city has received I know of four projects now within the past year and a half that are going through a conditional use permit process, either within the Millville district. We just received another one today, conditional use permit for a home on North Harborview Drive to convert that into a short-term rental. There are some notorious concerns experienced with short-term rentals, not necessarily here, but in other areas that people are aware of, such as uh, increased parking demand, increased noise, um, generally things of, of that nature. Um, there is another potential issue, and again, seeking would like to see council's input on this, that the level of an area in which this lodging opportunity is being sought currently is within our downtown core area. Um, three of them uh, that are going through the permit process are specifically within the historic district within Millville. Our code itself uh, was last amended in 2006 regarding lodging and different lodging categories were combined into a lodging level one, two, and three. Back uh, as far as the record that I've been able to look at, uh, BBROs, Airbnb short-term rentals, were not uh, a, as big of a thing or maybe just coming onto the scene back in 2006. Whereas now it's a lot of people's primary way of wanting to vacation instead of a hotel, go to Airbnb short-term rental. So 
we know that Gig Harbor is a desirable area. We know that uh, we have our own tourism and uh, marketing department set to bring tourists into the city. Um, we also know that we have some fairly strict zoning laws within the city, in particular within the historic district and the Millville area that are set on not only keeping dwelling units um, and other structures looking and feeling the same way, but also the historic district in terms of the neighborhood feel uh, of the historic neighborhood, which brings up a point of, you know, are we at the crossroads where we need to address this in, in our code further or, or not? Um, one of the biggies though that we've heard is a conversion of a neighborhood, in particular, the Millville area, which we know is very desirable. It's the quintessential, you know, historic neighborhood within, within the city. Um, is there just some things that run through my mind? Is there a threshold of a percentage of units that could be converted and still have the neighborhood there and not have the entire Millville neighborhood turn over into lodging? You know, is there a percentage um, where that would kind of trigger the neighborhood feeling to go away? Um, and so I, I say this more as a jumping off point as an introduction, not necessarily saying that we need to address this in any certain way, but definitely looking for some feedback as to if this is something we should look at, you know, in the upcoming 2022 year. Is there, is there any indication here that um, there are more than just individual owners involved in these units? Um, this has become a huge problem in certain communities um, where the under the guise of b and B, it's actually a timeshare in disguise. And there are massive real estate companies that are involved in this. In fact, one guy was went from zero to two billion in rentals like in less than a year, okay, in a certain um, popular areas of the country. Okay, and the, the article I was reading in the Washington Post, which was pretty thorough, said, hey, uh, the, the deal there is it, it, it has all the appearances of, of a BNB, uh, but it's actually a timeshare in disguise. They have, there's individual investors in it, but there's a central organization that's running this thing, okay? And they make it look that, they make it look like it's a small thing, but it's not really, it's pretty big. Um, that, that alone scares me. <laughs> if, if there's a threshold, I think it's fairly low in, in, in time to stop something, okay, or at least slow it down to a significant extent uh, via the legislative route. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually the one that really wanted to get this on the agenda. And, um, in, in addition to those other possible negative consequences um, that Katrina mentioned, I, I believe quality of life for the <clears throat> residents in the neighborhood should be included in that list of um, negative impacts. Um, the, the way that, um, you know, in, in, uh, Katrina was mentioning how many uh, permits had come in for it, but the, the thing that we don't know is how many people are doing it uh, that aren't going through the formal process of um, becoming quote unquote uh, legalized. So I, I have a feeling that there's a lot of people that are doing it that are just kind of under the radar. And in talking to uh, Mark Hoppen, who was uh, most recently um, the city manager, I think, I don't know if it's a city administrator, city manager up at Normandy Park. Um, he had suggested, because if we go through the legislative process, that, that can kind of be a, a drawn out process. The way they addressed it in, in that uh, jurisdiction was through the business license um, process. And 
I, I can't remember if I forwarded uh, all of you the, the letter that um, Mark had yeah. uh, sent me regarding all that, but that is a, a real um, way to have some clear cut guidelines in place um, under the business license provisions, whether it be how many days a year you can do it, um, whether or not you know the the person that's that's doing this needs to also be a resident there. Um, I thought that it was it was pretty well thought out the way they approached it at um, Normandy Park. So, are, are you familiar with the, that the process that they use there, Katrina? I am lo looking at it now. I read Mark's email. I think back in May, he had sent something to Bob Larson, and I'm I'm just pulling that up and looking through it now. I did talk to Daniel Kenny just before this meeting, and um, he recalls going through this process with Mark at Normandy Park and said it is something that the city could consider. And just to um, maybe toot Michelle's horn a little bit, she has. Uh, really done a great job at expediting our business license process. And she has um, very customer service orientedly uh, mentioned to some of these folks coming in for business licenses that there's a process, a land use process to go through. And I think that's partially why two or three of them have come in for permits. Yes, yeah, so Mayor Kuhn, you got your hand up there. Yeah. So. Um... A couple, a couple is one thing, but a lot in an area is, is not good. And so I guess maybe you've talked to Daniel about this, you know, it's, let's just say someone buys in an area and they base buying it on doing this. It's, you know, you probably can't deny it after without the repercussions of maybe being sued, but, um, but you could stop the future of them. And if they have not, filed for a license or they've tried to go under the radar, then my feeling is they don't, they don't deserve, they haven't, they haven't shown that they were doing this illegal way. So, you know, we have to be careful of repercussions. I, did you talk to Daniel at all about how we, we can't make a code on someone that's already utilizing it because especially if they, they bought an expensive home based upon this, but we could stop future ones by doing an ordinance or something. Is that, is that your understanding? Yes, generally, the how it would go is anyone that's gone through the process of getting a conditional use permit for lodging level one for a short-term rental that has an approval from the hearing examiner, that approval, that conditional use permit would go with the land. So anyone that has already gone through the process would allow be allowed to continue forward. Um, those that are operating, if the city were to do something, if that's the assumption here, uh, with regulations, um, anyone who's operating one right now without approval would not have any legal rights to that use and then would become illegal non-conforming. Okay. Well, then the last comment is I think this is of the, of the utmost, utmost importance because our real estate's becoming so valuable, you could have a neighborhood that just changes completely. Yeah. Yes. Councilmember Frenich. Uh, yes, thank you. So Katrina, if we, somebody went through a land use act to, to get a conditional use permit for it, and we enacted a, a business license, some standards under the business license, the land use, the, a, a prior land use decision would trump the business license? Yes. Well, that, then uh, I, I'm with the mayor because going through, I mean, if, if we want to make it have an or get this codified in, in our land use section of our code book, that unless the council decides to take it under direct consideration, that process would be a lot more time consuming, uh, I believe, than going through trying to get some sort of handle on this through the business license provisions. Is that a fair assumption? Yes. Well, I, I think that um, maybe it, I, I would very much support 
us moving forward it, with with Daniel and and trying to formulate a um, a set of standards that we incorporate it into our business license procedure um, because I, I I do really believe that uh, that would be the fastest and and Mr. Hoffman who I have a, a great deal of respect he's got a lot of um, history being city administrators and city managers so I, I respect his opinion um he seemed to think that that was the quickest way to get something done so um i i don't know what what we need to do to i, I haven't heard tracy speak on it i think council member hines seems to think that it is something that we need to address and it sounds like mayor kuhn also yeah. feels that it's something that we need to get moving on so um i'd appreciate to hear what uh, Council Member Markley has to say. Um, I mean, I I hear where everybody where everybody's coming from. I mean, I heard Katrina say this isn't really an issue right now, but it could become a large issue potentially if we don't do something. You know, in terms of um, revising, you know, the bit how our business license procedures would work for VRBOs or, you know, things like this. Um, um, I guess, you know, do we have any data on how many current, how many VRBOs or short-term rentals are currently in our city and what would the, what would the impact be on tourism and economic development? Should we try to discourage these types of lodge this type of lodging in our city you know there's only so many hotels and 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 you're right people do prefer right now especially with covid to stay in a house versus a hotel because they just don't know how clean the hotel rooms are and so i don't want to kill our you know an aspect of our tourism but at the same time i think it is still something we need to have a grip on and not let it go crazy. So it's kind of like, how do we balance out not letting it go crazy, but not just outlawing these completely, because I think that would really take away from some of the people that do come here on a regular basis to and, and want to rent houses for their, you know, family reunions or whether they're a larger house and they bring, you know, their immediate members of their immediate family and extended family to come into town you know, once a year and do a family reunion or, you know, they don't all want to stay in a hotel. They want to stay, you know, in a house. And so I'm just sort of playing devil's advocate a little bit, you know, just, just to look at both sides, to look at the people coming into town and what their desires are for lodging, and then look at the other side too, to make sure that it doesn't get overrun by people that are not taking care of their properties. We certainly don't want that. Um, so I don't know which rule book would need to be changed or which, you know, policies might need to be updated to make sure, because I don't think it's reasonable to say that the property owner has to live in the house and rent it out to it. Like that most property owners own it and rent it out as a, as a vacation rental. They don't live there. So it's, that would, I don't know that that makes much sense requiring that the owner has to be on site the whole time that they're that these people are staying there, this sort of defeats the purpose of having a vacation rental. So those are my, those are my initial thoughts. I, you know, I see the problem on both, on both sides potentially. So open to suggestions, you know, as, as have already been made and, you know, but I don't want to pigeonhole us either, you know, one way or another, if, I don't know if there's a, happy medium somewhere, but I'm just Jim, looking at, I'm trying to look at both sides. Jim, before you go, uh, Katrina, do you know how many we have in Millville and how many potential applications we have? I believe there's three that are permitted. And um, there's several that are tried. For full, for full disclosure, I have not gone on VBRO or Airbnb and put in Gig Harbor, because I also see oversee the code enforcement arm of the city, but I am told that there are many. Are there are they condos or single family residential houses? I believe there's both. Both. 
Okay. And just a there's also some uh, single family homes that have guest um, like detached garages with a, a space above that's not intended for living that has been converted. Um, but again, I have not gone searching. Just to um, I'll just jump in here for a second. The, the, the concern that I have, and again, I'm going back to this this uh, Washington Post article, which was pretty thorough. And by the way, it was in Napa, California is where it happened. And the trick to this whole thing is be, by the time they realized what was going on, <laughs> the, the town had been, was essentially converted into another Disney World, okay? Literally. Uh, that's, the, that's the fear that I have. By the time we figure it out, will we have time to respond, okay? Or do we respond now as a defensive measure as fast as we can uh, to prevent this possible thing? Um, the other thing I would say relative to the, 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 um, uh, the tourist business, um, I, I would assume the, the residents of Gig Harbor would be, um, I, I tend to give them a little more weight than the tourists, to be quite honest. Uh, and I'm not even sure who owns some of these places, okay? And again, I'm going back to this idea that big money is getting into this business, okay? Uh, and, and could go even further with it. So it's not like there's a crisis right now, but there could be one building very, very quickly. Um, and, and that was the, the crux of this whole Washington Post article. Yeah, Jim. Uh, thanks, Bob. I appreciate your comments. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely believe that um, the residents' quality of life, especially the ones that are impacted by this, far outweighs any uh, tourism or economic uh, reality that, that could take place from this. Um, you know, I, I know on Ross Avenue that well, I don't know because I haven't really done the legwork, but it's my understanding that one of the ones that's just recently going for the land use action, it's the owner has no intention of, of living there and he wants to turn it into a, eight, a place for eight people. And um, I, I really think that it, people that want to operate this type of thing really should live in the house because I, I think they're more invested with their neighbors. And when you have absentee landowners, it sounds like like what could have been happening in Napa. Um, I think uh, there could be more of a, of a disregard for your neighbor's right to have a, a quality of life at, at their R1 neighborhood that they thought they were buying into. So I, I really think this is a big deal. And, and I know it's a big deal in Millville, especially on Ross Avenue. And um, I, I think the longer that we wait, the, the, just the more that this could potentially be a problem for not only the residents that are gonna be impacted by this on Ross Avenue, but in other neighborhoods throughout the town. So um, I, I'm really in favor of, of trying to get moving on this ASAP. I guess I'm in agreement. Um, Councilmember Barkley, you were the um, the voice of restraint here. I guess is the word I use. Um, is there you, the 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 facts, the current facts, um, don't necessarily support action at this point. Uh, but this this thing that uh, it could happen so quickly. It, do you have any any sense of, of how that fits into to your opinion of this thing? Um, well, like I said, I was I was trying to you know look at it from both sides. Wasn't saying I disagreed with either of you. I certainly don't want this to get overrun or turn into something like what happened with Napa. I haven't read that article. I don't know if you sent it, but I, if you did, I didn't get it. I, I, um, I didn't send it. I just wrote it. In fact, I just read it this weekend. This past oh, okay. Um, it'd be interesting to read, you know, just, just to see what, what you're talking about, you know, learn more about what you're talking about. Yeah. But if, 
you know, if you're feeling really strongly and, you know, if Mayor Kuhn, if you're having a sense that this could be something that could get out of control pretty, pretty quick, you know, I don't see any, I don't see any problem with starting to talk about changing the, the, the structure of how it's currently going to a more strict, you know, more strict guidelines. I don't think out, I don't think outlawing VRBOs outright is going to go over well with anybody, but if there's a way that we can rein it in, you know, through some tighter policies, I don't have any problem with that. And I think it's probably a good idea to do that. So we get a hold of it and get on top of it before it turns into something out of control. Okay. So, yeah, it, it's, um, it is a tough one because it is popular. And when I go places, I like it. And um, a lot of people will behave fine. But then you do get certain people that will party every Friday or Saturday night at, at a certain house. And then it does, does, does destroy it for the neighborhood. Um, I just went on VRBO and there's, there's like 30 around Gig Harbor, but there are two or three in Millville and there's three of them before you get to Millville from downtown. Um, and that's just VRBO. If you go to Airbnb, they don't really show the same kind of map. So as I think there are a lot more than we realize, I know, um, uh, I know several prominent people that have them. And they don't even they don't even pay taxes on them, and they're they're prominent people in the in the area, and and they don't pay any taxes, so they're even um, not going by the standards that are allowed. So I'm afraid that if we don't do something, it will it will be too late, and um, because the ones are grandfathered in that that have a, a huge right with uh, lawyers. Um, especially if they're timeshares, which is a whole new thing. I hadn't heard about that, uh, Councilmember Himes, but it makes perfect sense. We, uh, we don't want to have a whole bunch of lawsuits, but I do think since they're grandfathered, I think we do have to do something fast. Here, a thought, and Katrina might know, since, this, since we don't want to offend people, but we do need to do something quickly. Remember when we had a temporary sign code for six months, and then we did it for a year? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we gave time to really study it before we made it permanent. And then we actually instead extended it for one more six months. Mm. Is it in that way we get input from people? Is it possible to put something that would be a temporary um, moratorium on new ones or something just until we have time to really study this so that we, we don't let future ones happen until we figure out the best plan. So it doesn't say that future ones can't happen, but it doesn't automatically allow new ones to happen before we get a grip on, on really how severe this is. There, there is an ability for the city to adopt interim zoning controls. What, what would be required for that is uh, amend, proposed amendments to 17 related to this topic. Now, interim zoning controls can be adopted as an emergency or not an emergency. Uh, and emergency is defined within the RCW as, you know, life safety issues. So if we were going to do as an emergency, we would need to consider, um, consider that. So the short answer is yes, we could adopt interim, interim zoning controls. We would need to have some agreement among council members as to what that is. In talking about a outright ban, even for um, a few months, our legal counsel has advised us against that due to um, the bill 5160 pertaining to um, the landlord tenant evictions. That bill was written um, very broadly to include the term uh, dwelling unit as a structure, meaning a home, a residence, or a sleeping place. And if we banned this, um, it could be seen as um, contrary to that um, bill. So I um, just wanted to, to bring that forward. I did have um, 
one or two ideas if now is the appropriate time. Yeah, I guess, I, uh, Councilmember Markley, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question. You know, uh, Katrina had mentioned earlier, and I think the mayor did too, about there being a lot more of these things than we realize, some that are not permitted, you know, and that haven't been reported, people that aren't paying property taxes. How would we even find these? I mean, how how would you, how long would it take to go through every single home in the in the city and figure out which ones are operating legally which ones aren't which ones are paying taxes like is it worth it to try to do that or that that was just just a question for the universe throw it out there to you but Katrina I'd love to hear your ideas for what well, I might what, jump in I've, I've already been approached by two companies that said hey we'll find all the places that are not complying and um we'll take 20% and then they have to comply. So there are agencies <laughs> and already approached us, several of wow. them. Wow. <laughs> yeah, in concurrence with what Mayor Kuhn said, I get probably two emails um, a week from companies that are seeking to help the city find the VBRO Airbnbs. And it's more from a tax perspective, missing revenue that the city is not um, receiving. Um, what was your original question, Councilmember Markley? Sorry, it, it was just how would you how would you find these people? That was my oh, that was my question, cool. and then so Mayor King kind of answered their companies that will go and find these people. So I don't know how yeah. much they cost to do that, but it might be worth it if there's like a hundred people doing this illegally or not not paying you know the revenues that they should be paying um you it's know it's easy but to find them because because the people i know that have rented from them found them on vrbo or airbnb so even though they're not paying any taxes they're out there just showcasing it <laughs> now does this does this apply to homes where like they've got their mother and father-in-law that they've moved onto their property because of either covid has you know made them vulnerable or they you know they've got a family they're helping or some other family members or even friends that have lost their home that they're helping does this apply to those situations or are these strictly people renting it out for cash and not just a like an, a normal ADU where you could have like an in-law or a grandma you know living on your property because that yeah. I wouldn't want to mess with those no the short term again is you know, 30 days or less for a lodging purpose. Okay. Not not a, a residence purpose. And to get to the enforcement issue, we are complaint based. So unless of course it's like safety and you know one of the inspectors drives by and sees somebody building a a deck okay. that, that we don't have a permit for. Um, but for enforcement, you know, we are complaint based if someone complains, then we will look into it. Um, or we can utilize one of the companies as the mayor said. Council member Frenich, and then I want to look at, at uh, how we can kind of wrap a bow around this one and say, hey, I think we've got, I think you've got a sense of, of, um, uh, of, of our, our thinking toward this, that is short term is a, is a big deal. <laughs> Yeah, and, like after Jim, Katrina had some thoughts. And, and, and get on it fast, okay? And I don't think we can solve it here, but I think versus what you were looking for in terms of the sense of interest in this, number one, I think there's interest in it, okay? Um, and, and then kind of what you would think as next steps. Jim, why don't you go ahead with your, your comment or question? Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure how I feel about uh, hiring the... Uh, investigative team to go out and, and search all this stuff out uh, that I'm, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not saying that I wouldn't <laughs> consider it, but uh, you know, that's just kind of not my deal, but um, uh, Katrina, you when, when the mayor had mentioned uh, uh, interim land use uh, pause on this, and you referred to the legislation talking about the um, eviction moratorium, would the if we put some sort of uh, interim land use 
control on this? I mean, would that really be violating the uh, the language in the state bill? No, not if we amended, temp uh, did the interim amendments to, you know, restrict or require permitting. If we banned them through interim zoning controls, then yes, we would be in violation of that. So. Yeah, no, in my intention is not to ban them at all. I mean, I'm not looking to ban them it, throughout the city or anything like that. I just think that, you know, I think we need to, um, we're here to represent the, the citizens of Gate Harbor and the quality of life in these residential neighborhoods, at least from my perspective, is, is, is was under assault this last legislative session. And I think there's going to be more assault to come on R1 zones in the future from the state. So um, I just, um, I think it is something that, that uh, we need to move on and I'll, I'll be interested to hear what, um, and, and I, as Councilman Markley said, I mean, it's not like we're gonna be able to in one week come up with uh, the, 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 the best language to, to wrap our hands around this, but I mean, at least getting the ball rolling in some manner, I think is critical. Okay, um, Katrina, you have the floor and uh, to, to summarize here and, 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 and my question to you will be, is there anything you need more from council or from this committee uh, to, to move this thing forward? In other words, I think there's interest here. I think we want to get started on something. And uh, uh, I think the something is not, as Jim was uh, elaborating, not a, not a ban but at least some measure of control okay, of what's what's happening or pre preventing what could happen, let me put it that way. Um, so I, I guess I'm gonna turn the floor over to you uh, in terms of any questions that, that you have relative to the committee or to council period and uh, kind of next steps. Okay, the, the two options that I that I've thought of and uh, workload is an issue for both of these, so I just wanna put that out there. Um, although we can find a way to fit it in, whether it's now or in the 2022 work plan. But, you know, there's two paths, I think, for analyzing this of, you know, to decide what we should, or what we should do as a city. One would be for staff to look at a SWOT analysis, look at the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of um, the Normandy Park example, versus amending the amending title 17 to be more explicit and restrictive um, and within that we could look at what council member markley had discussed at the the tax dollars and the revenue and effect on business and that could be part of that SWOT analysis um, and then it, within that option we would come back to the planning and building committee for direction to see if we wanted to do interim zoning controls or or whatnot the second option would be to direct the planning commission to consider this and have a public hearing maybe and give you their feedback um, i will note that this topic in particular has not had any public hearing ever uh, so, you know, we, we, we've heard from people complaining, but we have not heard from the general public as a whole. And so I think it would probably be a good idea to put this out there and receive public input. So those are kind of the two options that, that I've thought of. Council Member Frenich. Well, th thank you, Katrina, for that. But, but I, I think that, um, Either one of those two processes is is just going to put us out too far. I, I think that the mayor's suggestion about immediately or within the next two council meetings enacting some sort of interim control on this um, is critical because this gets out there and then the flood of applications start coming in and we're starting to have to question whether something's vested or not. Um, I think we just need to hit the pause button on this as soon as possible. And that will give us time to properly um, do a SWOT analysis or any other sort of analysis um, that, that we deem necessary. But um, prolonging this um, 
months and months and months, I, I, I think that that could be very problematic. So within your proposal, Councilmember French, for clarification purposes, the interim zoning controls to stop this, that would be a temporary ban. Is that what, what you're referring to? So we would not allow any more of these for a temporary period of time or- well, wh um, Whatever language that we would need to, to do that, I guess a ban in the sense that I don't want anybody coming in right now getting vested and while we're working our way through trying to figure out the best language, um, they're vested. Right. Okay. Uh, Council Member Markley. Um, yes. Would it be a temporary ban or would it just be a pause on applications? Yeah. Can we well, just pause application submittals? Like, it, like a moratorium on applications for new VRBOs that gives us a chance to do what Councilmember French, you know, was saying and, and, and concerned about, but then also allow time for, I think a public hearing on this subject would be a great idea, but, but also a temporary solution ahead of that would also be a good idea. So how could we make that work? The, the two things that you bring up are essentially the same. The one difference that I see in them is one would disallow any, basically all of them. Um, the other option would ban new, new short-term rentals. So it would allow ones that have gone through the process to continue. Legally, well, um, don't we legally to... need to have? Wouldn't we legally need to do that anyway? At, at the risk of not getting in trouble with this particular bill and things like like that, you know, as as Mr. Kenny advised us not to stop ones that are already currently vetted and going, but if we just temporarily stop the new ones from happening, does that conflict with those? those bill regulations, would that get us in trouble or would it buy us some time to do the research that we need to do? I, I don't want to speak for Daniel, but based on my conversation with him today, I think that that's something that would be fruitful to look into. I'd want to have a conversation with him before I commit to us being able to do that. However, I think that that meets the intent of what he was talking about. Yeah, okay. I, I think uh, putting a, putting a, a temporary hold on new applications um, is a smart way of going because we're not we're not going after people that have already spent the time and money, and we're and we're not even actually seeing that we're not going to um, open it up again, but we're going to do more research and we're going to do open houses, but we're not going to let the flood, we're not going to let every everyone just jump in on new ones when we're trying to figure it out. So how we word it, a ban sounds so strong. A temporary hold Take on new down. applications until we can do a public outreach. Yeah, and I think if you put a lot of emphasis on the public outreach part, so people know we're trying, we're going to be transparent with this. We want to know what the community thinks, but at the same time, we're still accomplishing the goal that we want to accomplish, which is stopping this kind of from getting out of control till we know more about what what restrictions we do want to put on it once we open it back up. Right. And we won't get in trouble on the eviction thing, as mm -hmm. Katrina said, because we're we're not doing an all right ban. I, I yeah. see a lot of heads moving up and down. I, I think we're, we're getting close to a consensus. This uh, yeah. is reminiscent, by the way, of the, um, the famous moratorium back in 2018. Right. We didn't <laughs> ban it. We just said, hey, we're pressing the pause button here for six months. And yeah, he, permits couldn't be uh, in, you know, accepted at that point. Uh, for so what do we need to do? What, what do we need to ask of you, Katrina, to do to get going on that way? Um, thank you, Mayor. Carl, did you have something? I just, I, I've been kind of sitting on my, on my mouse over here for a minute, but I've just, I got to chime in and just say that um, if, so if we, if we don't allow any applications to come in for short-term rentals, we are essentially not allowing any applications to come in. I believe, and I'm just throwing this out there, I could be wrong, Katrina, but I think 
that we would be not allowing applications for any lodging level one at all, right? Because we define, sure, we don't have a definition necessarily for short-term rentals. We view them as uh, a lodging level one, which does, you know, includes other types of lodging, like a bed and breakfast, for instance, which is, you know, something that is, I think, more consistent with what people uh, traditionally would expect in their neighborhoods. You know, somebody's living there, they've got an extra room for rent, you know, they've got the ADU that they're renting out, um, and then they maybe have a meal or breakfast in the kitchen, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, the, I guess the, the vacation rental by owner and Airbnb has kind of taken over that market for the most part. I think they've taken it by storm. So we probably don't get or haven't gotten many of those applications really coming through. So it might be a moot point, but I wanted to just throw it out there that we are essentially saying not taking any applications for lodging level one, if that's the route we took. Thank Is you, lodging Carl. level under 30 days? No, we don't have that definition. That would be something that staff would want to, throughout this period, if we do end up with interim zoning controls, staff would like to further clarify through definitions and conditions um, what the community's expectation is so that I'm not left interpreting the code um, as often as I do now for this purpose. Uh, Carl, I, I, I do think, Carl, we can we can craft this to not be all lodging level one. But again, we'll need to work with Daniel to carefully craft that. Okay. Um, Council Member Himes, to answer your question, to move forward um, today, or maybe this was the mayor, excuse me, uh, we would need a council consensus if that's how you'd like us to move forward. We would then, what I would like to do is mention this to the council at your next meeting, that this is what we're looking to undertake. Um, and in the meantime, prior to September 27th, when we could likely have this on the council agenda, again, pending Daniel's concurrence, we would have then all the documents put together, public outreach um, expectations set forth uh, for the planning commission hearings, et cetera. So if we have that um, concurrence from the committee today, we can move forward to the next item. Okay, I see a lot of committee members' heads moving up and down. I'm going to take that as consensus right now that we are in agreement to move forward as Katrina was just indicating. Uh, is that the case? Jim, you're nodding. Tracy, oh, you're... Yes, I'm sorry. I just saw my hand was still up. No, oh. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to make sure that... I think Katrina already answered my question I was going to ask was, can we craft the language in this, in whatever moratorium or however we do it, um, can we craft that to not include all of zoning one and all of, or not lodging one, is that what's called lodging one? If we can specify that this doesn't apply to bed and breakfasts or, you know, things like that, like, and like you said, Katrina, I think once you speak with Daniel and figure out what that language needs to say, at least it wouldn't, impact that entire group it's just going to impact the group we we want it or need it to impact for right now is that is that what you were saying yes that's that's what we'll look to craft the kind of a a good backstop for this there's not been an application for a bed and breakfast since i've been over on this side of the building for however long okay. i've been now so yeah i'm in consensus with what with going forward with how you need to proceed. Okay, great. I think we're in violent agreement here. Uh, so if we can proceed with basically the process that you outlined, Katrina, I, I think that you've got the uh, the consensus of the committee. Great, we will move forward. Okay. Thank, thank you all for that. Council Member uh, Himes, I'm so, so, I have to step away for about 30 seconds. I'll be right back. Okay. Just stay out of traffic, whatever you do. I'm getting emails coming in all over the place. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, we'll take a, a 30 second pause here then. And our, 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 or we can start uh, thinking about this House Bill 12, 1220, Emergency Shelters and Housing, Local Planning Development. Um, and I guess Katrina, when you wanna jump in there, um, we can uh, introduce this topic. And uh, hopefully Tracy will be back She's down to 25 seconds, by the way. Um, 
you know, at the risk of uh, me getting booted off because I, you know, me and computers, can you maybe uh, try and uh, zoom that in a little bit, please? If you guys, um, Carl or anyone else that's on there, can you, is there a zoom option for you on your side to zoom in on the user side? I don't see one. I don't see one either. Yeah, if you if you go to the view options at the top of your screen, oh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and drop that down. There's a zoom ratio. Yeah, uh, and you should be able to. There, you might be able to just bring it into full screen, and that should just kind of it should just overtake your whole screen and put everybody else to the side. Or you can use one of those other perspectives that are, that are given there. That work for everybody. Um, well, I'm, yeah, now that worked for me. Okay. Or, or is that you that did that? Nope, I haven't done anything yet. I, I just did the, the view options up at the top of the screen and it worked great. Yeah. I went from 100% to 150 and it took up a lot of my screen. Now I can read everything. Excellent. Okay. Well, without further ado, this uh, is a, a House Bill 1220. It was passed in May and has an immediate effective date for some of the GMA related items that I'll discuss and has a September 30th effective date for a city action that we will be bringing forward at the September 27th under interim zoning control. So we may have two that night. Um, I did attach the bill to this memo online if you'd like to peruse that at your leisure. Um, but what I'd like to do today is go through the different sections of the bill that I've summarized here for you and then talk about the next steps for, for how we're gonna deal with this. Uh, essentially, the bill made some amendments to the Growth Management Act pertaining to affordable housing and what the city's obligations will be under its housing element in the 2024 update. Additionally, um, under um, section three, the city will need to make code amendments to be consistent with this bill by the end of September. And so we'll get to that in just a minute. So bill, the bill section one amends the Growth Management Act updating the housing goal definition so whereas right now jurisdictions are encouraged to provide affordable housing options, the uh, language has been um, changed from encouragement to that we will provide for affordable housing. Uh, within bill section two, it amended the Growth Management Act to require jurisdictions to inventory, analyze, plan, and accommodate dwelling units for and this is what was added, moderate, low, very low, and extremely low income households. And the bill also requires us to plan for, accommodate, analyze inventory, emergency housing, emergency shelters, and permanent supportive housing. Um, both section one and section two can be accommodated through the city's comprehensive plan periodic update that's due in 2024. We do have a, a housing analysis that has been a carryover for the past two years that we just haven't been able to get to either due to COVID or um, staffing issues that we think that we can address this and have an adequate um, public process and discussion about these things in the budget that's forthcoming to council soon. So that would be a 2022 work plan item to do the inventory and analysis in advance of the 2024 periodic update where we would expect to plan for and accommodate those different types of um, low income households. I see there's questions I can pause. Councilmember Frenick, you had a question. Uh, yes, uh, does this I'm looking under section three and it talks about having to do these things, but does it anywhere um, address the number? 
of these types of units? No. Okay, well, that's good from my <laughs> perspective anyway. Thank you. Yep. Council Member Markley. Yes, Katrina, under section two, where it says to analyze, plan for, and accommodate emergency housing, emergency emergency shelters, and permanent supportive housing, is the are do those have to be like we have to build things like build buildings to a to you know like build shelters, build or can we use churches as shelters? Can we use schools as shelters? Like. Does it lay out specifically if we have to actually create a shelter, build a shelter, or if in an emergency, we can use another building as a shelter? Just out of curiosity. The, um, I'm gonna leave my personal perspective feelings out of this. Um, it did not provide that guidance to us. So, it's not saying that the city has to use capital funds to build these. It's saying that we need to analyze how much of this based on our population we need, which is something that we have never done before. And I don't think many jurisdictions of our size have done that before, right. um, as well as plan for and accommodate. So how I'm reading this, and again, we'll need to do more research on it, but there's other jurisdictions like um, I believe Puyallup has a contract with a hotel within the city of Tacoma that's close to services. And so that is how they are accommodating the need for emergency housing, et cetera. Um, so I believe that as long as we have a plan to accommodate for that, it doesn't necessarily need to be here and the city doesn't need to, doesn't need to be the one to provide it. We just need to show that we are adequately, that we have a plan to address it, basically that we don't have blinders on, that it, it doesn't happen here. There's a similar um, situation happening in Bremerton at a hotel in Bremerton where they're that basically, I think about 75% of this hotel is occupied currently by people that are needing interim housing. And, and at a very low, the, the, these people are very low income, like ba low basic social security disability at $800 a month or, or less is their total monthly income. And there are programs that started with, with um, COVID rescue funds, not the CARES Act, it was actually separate funding that Kitsap County got in order to offer this type of housing in a hotel, it's a hotel suite, but this was a, this is how they were able to house whole families together, families with children or, or couples, whereas a lot of the permanent supportive housing is not shared. It can't be shared with male and female. It's either a women's house or a men's house, but you can't have couples living in there and you can't have children living there with a mother, father, and the children that are living there have to be under a certain age because of problems that can arise with teenagers living in the home with younger children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the hotel situation was a way or is a way that they're addressing homelessness with homelessness of families and or single mothers with children or or elderly couples, you know, just more than one single person that's homeless. That's how they're that's how they're accommodating that. So, you know, the only hotel I can think of in town that we might talk with is maybe in of Gig Harbor would be the like the the larger solution, but there would be we would have to go for it'd have to be some kind of a, of a grant or funding that would come that would come in to support that kind of program. So the hotel is still getting paid for the room every month that at the at the going rate, but the people living in it are part of a program that allows them to only pay like 20% of what that room cost is. So it makes it affordable for them to live there, but they still have to pay something, but the hotel still gets paid their, the full amount. So it's those types of programs. If we can find out what, well, I know I can find out what, how that's all working in this one hotel in Bremerton, because it is working very well. 
and the families know that they're only there temporarily. It's a temporary emergency housing situation. They're not going to live there forever. And then as each month goes by, they pay a little bit more, they pay a little bit more, and they pay a little bit more. So it encourages them to go out and find permanent housing. But it is a it is working very well as emergency housing. And so that's something to, to look at. That's what I was wondering. That was why I was asking is if that was specific, like we have to actually build a shelter or can we do something like that? So can we use another building for the same purpose without having to build another building, you know, from scratch and use it simply only for that purpose? So thank yeah, you for- we, we can do that. Okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, Mayor Coon, you had your hand up. Do you yeah, I, I think that's part of the reason why this bill happened is, you know, if you think of Fife and you think of Federal Way, there were some hotels that probably didn't even, weren't even filled very much. And this was, this actually allowed the hotels to fill their hotels and also help out families at the same time. And then as, as uh, Councilman Markley pointed out, it also, you know, if you have the right funding system in place, it can help uh, in both of them. So, um, yeah, we don't have to build anything. We just have to have it available. The Indigate Harbor has turned, more, it's more of a national chain than it used to be. It's not owned by the past developed, the past person. So um, I guess we look for Katrina. What, what, are, what steps do we need to take? A great question and a good lead into section three, which does talk about what we need to do in the meantime. So section three of the bill um, added a section to RCW 35A21. And what it states is that a code city, which is us, shall not prohibit transitional housing or permanent supportive housing in zones in which residential dwelling units or hotels are allowed. And I do agree with the mayor that I believe that this was done in direct, um, as a direct cause of certain cities trying to prohibit hotels from being utilized for um, the, the temporary supportive housing. Essentially what this will, what this does is the city's zoning code will need to be amended to add in definitions of transitional housing and permanent supportive housing and have them as uh, loud uses in all of the zones where residential and hotels are allowed. Uh, I'm in the process of working through that ordinance with Daniel um, that will be proposed to you council on the 27th under interim zoning controls. Now, what that will mean is you do not conduct a public hearing on this. Um, you will conduct a public hearing on this within 60 days to take public input. We will then, similar to the previous agenda item about short-term rentals, we will have six months. So we'll put together a work plan uh, for public outreach. Uh, staff is recommending that we utilize the Planning Commission as a um, sounding board for council to provide a recommendation or several recommendations as to whether the interim zoning controls should be upheld or amended. Uh, but recall, no matter what we do, we cannot prohibit them the um, transitional housing or permanent supportive housing within those zones. There is one other option within the bill that states that cities that uh, you can either do it this the way allowing it within all residential zones with where dwelling units or hotels are allowed or you can allow them within your city within one mile radius of uh, your bus or rapid transit line. So for us, we know where our uh, one route 100 goes through downtown and up around Gordon down Peacock. When we looked at that, uh, the one mile radius, it didn't make sense for us because we're a fairly narrow city. So the recommendation that we have right now is to move forward to be consistent with state law to allow for the transitional housing and permanent supportive housing within uh, essentially any of our zones that were that allow for dwelling units or hotels. Um, no. 
Councilmember Markley. So in regards to permanent supportive housing, is there anything, and I should just read the bill, but is there anything in the bill that says that someone that's wanting to utilize their home, like rent it out to an organization that would then manage a permanent supportive housing system? Is there anything saying that something like that has to be managed by an organization or can it just be a person that just decides I'm going to rent my house out by the room to help homeless people, but I'm not going to monitor them. I'm not going to, because I know how it works from personal experience both ways. And so I'm just wondering if the bill had any specifications on what permanent supportive housing is or means, or if they really clearly defined that. Fortunately, they do not provide those definitions very clearly. Okay. Um, and, and I do think that the regulations for such housing would take place outside of the land use codes of the state. Okay. I guess li likewise, I had a similar question. The supportive housing and the affordable housing, is there any quantification of what this thing is? Is it a rental rate relative to some percentile of income in the in the local district or anything like that? No, the, the definitions provided are, unfortunately, the bill does not define uh, transitional housing or permanent supportive housing. It does, however, define emergency housing and Okay, I need to think about that. I'm uh, an emergency. It defines emergency housing and emergency shelter. Okay. Councilmember Himes, generally in a permanent supportive housing housing situation, the pers the people that live in the home have to have some kind of income, whether it's social security disability, whether it's a job, they have to have some kind of income to pay the the room rate. And whether they're in, and most often they're involved in a program where the house is either ha has a live in house manager or they have a house manager that lives outside the house that holds weekly meetings to make sure that everything's tracking, make sure that the people are doing okay, you know, conflict resolution, all of that kind of stuff. And most often they are very good neighbors to the people around them when there is an organization that is responsible for what's happening in the house. If there isn't an organization responsible for what's happening in the house, then it becomes a whole nother story. There aren't a ton of people trying to do that because they, most landlords don't want their own home to be ruined potentially. And so most often if a landlord's gonna decide to use their home in, in, as a rental in that way, they are renting it to a 501c3 nonprofit that is that is fully, that has an agreements that they sign with each person that moves into that home. There's house rules. They are very strict house rules. They're usually sober homes, no alcohol allowed, no drugs allowed, you know, and, and, and very, very strict. That's usually how those operate. Okay. So, so it's more than just a rental rate. Yes. And it's, it's normally based upon the income that the person is is able to afford. If they're on a $788 a month income, they try to have the room with the cost of utilities be at least where they have about $100 left over for bus fares, you know, what, whatever other thing that, you know, a cell phone, a cheap cell phone, you know, that they might need. Um, they try to keep the rates down to where someone that's even on the lowest amount of income possible can still afford to live there. And generally the people that move in are very willing to go by the rules because they'd rather be in a house than on the street or back in a shelter. Um, and so they are usually very, very good neighbors and they're very, they're very well behaved once they get in there. There are some issues with mental health that come up. And as long as the police department knows where these houses are being operated and they, and they, they're aware that there may be some issues that might come up, might come up, you know, with, with a mental health 
breakdown or you know some something then it's generally okay and then you also have the organization and the house managers helping to to mitigate that kind of thing so that they're, they're not just calling the police all the time they're calling the organization first saying hey this person's having an issue they so that's the first line of defense and then if it just can't be handled or the person some person goes off the rails then maybe the police need to be called and some experts need to be you know that's that's a that's that doesn't happen as often when it's in a controlled situation being run by a nonprofit that is experienced and has staff that are mental health professionals on staff that are there to help these folks. So that's that's how those usually operate. But what I'm what I'm hearing the bill say is that if some if a landlord in city limits decided they wanted to use their house for that purpose, we can't stop them from using it for that purpose or we can't stop an organization from renting the home to use to house homeless folks. I, I'm, that's, that's what I'm thinking the bill is saying, is that right? That's right. And, and through this, when we, through the interim zoning controls, when we allow them, you know, the, there will be opportunity through the public process to put conditions on, on these housing. So it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be permitted. It can be you know, a conditional use permit so that we can review for um, for certain uh, parking or uh, noise or anything like that. Um, so we will be able to do that. We just cannot outright disallow them. I was able to find the state definitions for both of those things that are not in the bill, however, are codified other places within state law, if you'd like me to read those. Okay. Okay. Now, Jim, you had your hand up and then he pulled it back down. Are you still? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm a little sensitive on this, uh, this subject. So I, I, I'm really, I think I'll, I'll wait till I, I get a little bit better education before I, I make any comments. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, what, what, what I'm hearing, it was just kind of interesting. Um, a lot of the stuff that, that's published is, um, and I guess I'm, I'm, I put myself in the common knowledge um, category on this thing is on the the the, the dollar side. Called, yeah, it's this much rent per month. Blah, blah, that's what's affordable. Or that's what's not affordable. Whatever. And what I'm hearing is a much more detailed um, uh, organization to organize and manage this thing. Okay, uh, like for example, the nonprofits you were talking about that, uh, that pull these things together, all the aspects of it. Uh, so that and, and that's um, it's just a new element to me. Let me put it that way. In terms of there's and it's by the way, it sounds like it's a key element. It's not just an element. It sounds like it's a key element. Okay, to make this thing work. Um, so something to keep in mind as we as we go forward is. In particular, is there any way that, that we can encourage um, that type of thing? Okay. In other words, you're saying it's standard practice, but for some of us that don't sleep nights on standard practice, we'd like a, some kind of a uh, pseudo law. Uh, is there a way that can be, be uh, uh, legislated or directed or whatever to get these necessary partners, for example, involved in these types of things? Um, that, that, that's where I'm at. In other words, instead of making it elective, make it, yeah, if you want to do business in Green Harbor, you know, this is the things you do uh, type thing. So with that, um, Katrina, uh, anything additional that you want to cover here? Just just to say that when we, um, when council considers um, and, and hopefully enacts this to bring us consistent with state law, we will have to have a public hearing within 60 days. So you can feel comfortable that you know anybody who wants to testify on this will be able to do so to the council within 60 days. And then we have six months then to evaluate the interim controls and then provide any amendments. So once we adopt them, they are interim and they are easily modifiable. Okay. So if we get it wrong the first time, um, there's opportunity within the six months to amend it to get it right. This, it would seem to me, and I'm just thinking out loud here, but um, boy, I'll tell you, um, public education prior to a hearing, it seems to me will be at a premium. Uh, 
Um, a lot of people, I think, would have a very um, uh, suspicious or negative view of this thing without necessarily digging very far into it. And, and I don't think we should subject the public to have to do a lot of their own digging. If there's any yeah, way I, we, can, we can educate yeah. before a hearing, I think would be worthwhile. So people can, can comment pro or con with some base of knowledge of what we're talking about here. Uh, to me, that would be critical. And that's just my own view, but I'm pretty strong on that call. Hey, I, I think we, we would need to do something there. By, by the way, I'm not talking salesmanship here. I'm talking basically basic facts. Okay, this is how this thing would operate. Okay. Yes, Tracy, and then and then Jim will be right behind Tracy. Yeah, if you want, uh, if you want me to come or ask some people who are boots on ground in this area, as I ha have been, I am not anymore. Um, but if you want some people who will just come and give you the facts of how these types of organizations work, what they do, that education that you're talking about, mm -hmm. I have a lot of people that can come and do that. And where they're not going to be salesmen, they're not going to pitch this, like, let's take over every rental and gig harbor and turn it into a, you know, permanent supportive housing, but they can at least explain the process, what the, what, what's involved in something like that and provide that education that you're looking for. Great, thank you. That's interesting. Jim, you had a comment. Yeah, um, Mayor, uh, it, this is kind of off subject. I, I mean, it, you know, we're, we're talking about public hearings and public input here a lot tonight. Um, is there any idea on uh, how long we're gonna be meeting online? Yeah, the two things, um, and, and Katrina would know this better than I would, but I think what Councilmember Markley is talking about that she's very much involved with and kind of this bill are, are two separate things on, on accommodating low income. Uh, you know, Councilmember Markley has a, a much more structured system that's in place for personal homing, personal homes and various things. And I think this bill refers to more a more broad, uh, different situation. And um, then, I, so I think there are two separate things. I'm not positive if, if that's true, but just to not waste Council Markley's time too. Katrina would know that. First thing, is that true? Uh, you know, Councilman Markley is very involved in something that's very well structured, but I think it's a, a little bit more structured than than what this council, what the, this house bill is is doing. Is that true, Katrina? Um, no, what Councilmember Markley is talking about is, is um, under, I believe, permanent supportive housing that I found the definition of in um, okay. RCW-670A030. I can read that definition. He's so like, it's, it's exactly what this type of bill is doing? It's part of it, yes. Okay. There, again, the bill is kind of an omnibus of all of the housing bills during the last session that kind of came together as one conglomerate. So it's not a bill focused on just supportive housing. So it's really trying to do many things in one bill. Okay. All right, uh, to answer Jim's question, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we're, we're uh, I mean, it's getting more restrict on our state. So, um, so I, don't, I don't see us getting out of this I mean, I'm, I'm trying to say, let's not decide for November right now. People are already trying to talk about canceling things in November. And I'm like, no, November is too far out. You know, October is one thing, but let, you know, let's have a wait and see um, and not, not go forward. I don't want to start making decisions for November until we get close to October. Um, but, it, but my point is, I don't think you know, I would love to be back in session in November, but right now I don't see the odds going that way. But again, let's we're not going to we're not going to determine too much in the future. That's fine. Thank I I don't mean to belabor it. I I appreciate the the yeah. answer. I do. I I one if I could just say one last thing before moving on. I, Councilmember Himes, your your suggestion is 
very well taken and I appreciate Councilmember Merkley's um, support on the education front. This has uh, thrown some communities into tizzies unnecessarily. So this is not, and I think this is what you're getting at Councilmember Himes, this is not an emergency shelter. This is not a tent city. This is not a tiny home yeah. um, village, right? And so I think, you know, what we as staff bringing this forward can work on is being very clear of what this isn't and clear about what it is and, you know, get that out ahead of time um, to the public. So we'll, we'll definitely do our best to do that. And then, like I said, the, 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 the management of this thing, uh, that there's somebody charged with that uh, responsibility, okay, or they accept that responsibility, I, I think is a big, it, that's a huge deal. Uh, that, that overwhelms a lot of criticism, let me put it that way, at least from my perspective, it does, um, uh, in, in trying to, to move forward on something like this. Yes, Council Member French. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm not the biggest fan of this type of bill. This is another erosion of local control. But that being said, I, I really appreciate what Katrina just said. And I think it would be, I, I think we'd be well served by staff coming up because people, they hear these terms that are, that are used in this uh, transitional housing, low, all these terms, unless somebody's pretty well knowledge about, about it, invested in it, they will jump to a lot of maybe unfounded conclusions. So I think by uh, the city coming out saying clearly what these are not, it, what this is not going to lead to, will go a long way in um, alleviating people's skepticism about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mayor Kuhn. Right. Which also brings to mind. The same, you know, September 27th council meeting, we have on a new business item, first reading of adoption of ordinance, we don't have a number yet, establishing interim zoning controls, emergency shelters and housing for the 27th of September. So back to what we're talking about. We have to word this very carefully, not to freak out people and get them thinking, oh my gosh, because you know, all they have to do is open up the news and they're going to think that this is something completely different. Yeah. So that's going to be under your topic on new business, Katrina. So however you can word that to um, lessen the, the emails to your staff as well as counsel and myself, I don't know how to do that. But, but um, they have to realize we have to explain it very carefully as we've all implied. Yeah, I, I think one idea that I just had was you know, potentially drafting something for maybe Tony or you, Kit, to send out, you know, in advance of saying, this is what this is. You know, we know this is a potential hot button issue. So at least we have something out to our social media um, and on our website. You know, if people, I know that our council bills are very invigorating and lovely to read, but not everyone thinks that and probably won't click on it to read the, the details. So. Right. And I agree with you. And and since this group cares and Councilman Markley knows a lot about this, if you would um, if you would craft that Katrina and then actually include me and Tony in the email, but send it out to these three council members since it's coming out of this and let them give feedback to you. Give them only so many days to do so. And then with your changes, send it on to Tony and I. And they, that way Councilmember Himes, Markley, and uh, Franich have actually been able to weigh in that, uh, see what you say, and then you can craft that from their comments and then send it on to Tony and I to review. Does that sound good to the three of you? Yeah, I was gonna say, Katrina, if you want any help with wording, phrasing, <laughs> keywords, you know, you know, whatever, descriptions to not scare people, you know, let me know because I know, I, I know what, what to say to not scare people about about what these organizations do and then if you want to provide links to some of these organizations websites where people can go and read about them read their mission statement read their house rules their program what, what they do and how they do it I think it would put a lot of people's minds at ease 
So I can put those in my email back to you or whatever you want me to do. Just let me know how you need me to support. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you. I think we've we've come to a uh, uh, an end point here. I hope we've come to an end point on this item. Uh, anything else on this? Great. I'll take the silence as concurrence in my comments. Uh, item number three: the growth discussion. Uh, I don't know if everybody's got a chance to to read through my uh, my amended when I found I made a math error, a big math error, as a matter of fact, uh, on this topic. Has everybody ever, ever got a chance to see that or do you want a, a little review? Okay. Uh, needless to say, uh, the whole thing, and by the way, the, there's, there's some of this data is in transition. Uh, like for example, I, I believe uh, Katrina that um, if you use the 2.3 occupants per dwelling, which is the new at least the census, 2020 census recognizes that number. If you recognize that number, uh, we, we actually met our, our target in 2020 for both population and for uh, dwelling units, because the, the, the 2.3 is gonna pull the required number of dwelling units down. It's gonna say the original one was an error, <laughs> okay, um, with that. So it, the, all the data that I used was basically in the Pierce County Buildable Lands Report, and some of that may be dated. Okay, some of those were estimates. Uh, for example, the number of units actually built in 220 was an estimate. It wasn't a hard hard fact, but I'm, I'm assuming it's fairly close. Um, so let me just quickly summarize. I think if if you read through the paper, the the uh, by way of history, the, the 2010 to 2020, we, we overachieved big time, uh, both in terms of population and in particular, in this case, dwelling units. Uh, we were about, if I remember correctly, 59% uh, uh, over the uh, required number of units. We had achieved 94% of our 2030 target in calendar year 2000. 20, which is spectacular, okay? Particularly if you look at those two charts that I referenced in the uh, 200 and some page buildable lands report on page 19 is the one that, that got me energized around this topic called, uh, we are one of the few that got to even 50% of our target, let alone 94% of our target. Uh, Pierce County as a as a whole county element only got to 27 percent, which would suggest to me that um, at the county level we were in trouble. Okay, getting to 2030. If you didn't have 50 percent in the bag by now, you'd have to do something spectacular to make up that shortfall from 27 to 50 percent, which you should have had in 2020 in addition to getting what I would call the normal buildable rate from 2020 up to 2030. So uh, this is a big, big deal. We, we built here uh, 174, on average, 174 dwelling units per year. When to meet our target, we only needed 94 dwelling units per year. So we, we overachieved by about 80 dwelling units per year. If you multiply that through, we, over, we were on, on, on course just with what had happened uh, over 10 years. If we overachieved by 80 units, dwelling units per year, we were 800 dwelling units over where we probably needed to be. And I, I refer to them as excess dwelling units. Okay, called these are things where things were built uh, spectacular uh, rate of growth, and uh, that that 800 number is a is a big one to keep in mind. Um, likewise, um, we shot the lights out in terms of 
uh, population increase, and I got this off the U.S. This comes from U.S. Census, census data. This is actual data. Uh, we grew from 7,126 in 2010 to 11,343 uh, in 2020. That's a 59% increase in population here. There's two parts to that. One is the dwelling units. The second part is the number of residents per dwelling unit went up um, in, in that period too. So uh, that, that's a big deal. Looking forward, uh, Moving forward from what I would call history, which 2010 to 2020, that's history, uh, to Vision 2050, which, by the way, covers the period from 2020 to 2044, as I understand it. And I also understand that those targets that are currently under development from 2020 to 2044 will replace the two th Vision 2040 targets. In other words, to the best of my knowledge, and jump in here, either Katrina or Carl, but they will replace that, okay? Those targets that were in, now that we've overachieved, they, they, they've replaced them. Um, so uh, going forward, uh, we've had some discussions, I know, with myself and Carl and Katrina, and we, we originally estimated that uh, somewhere between uh, 1%, about 1.3% growth per year was probably the, the target area. So it was, it, it's probably going to fall somewhere in that range, I think was the, the, the way I would describe it. So if, if you accept 1%, for example, uh, we would have to come up with 1,272 incremental dwelling units from 2020 to 2044. At the 1.3% rate, we'd have to come up with 1,644 dwelling units, which is significant. Now, again, that's from the period 2020 to 2044. So here's where it starts getting interesting. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there is no indication that Gig Harbor's 800 excess dwelling units in the 2010 to 2020 uh, is going to be factored into our target. Correct me if I'm wrong, Carl, but I'm not aware of any movement in that area. That's correct, Councilmember Himes. There is no credit per se for okay. any excess. So so, uh, and I think there's two parts to that, um, that, that, that issue. Uh, one, there's no indication <laughs> that jurisdictions that failed to meet 50% of their 2010 to 2030 target, um, there's no consequences there. So we overachieve, we build places, we can't take those places back. We can't fill in the, the foundation, start all over again and say, well, these really counted toward the 2020, 2044. They're already built. And by the way, they do count in the bottom line. <laughs> okay, heading toward 2044. Um, so anyway, uh, if, if we were to include those as a credit forward, because we actually built the units, uh, suddenly, the number of dwelling units required from 2020 to 2044 would drop to 1,272 minus 800 is 472 units, or on the other extreme end, uh, the 1.3% growth number of 1,644 units would drop to 844 dwelling units. It's, it has a huge impact on the target going forward, okay? Um, and I also might add that, that um, there's what I call, uh, uh, buildable lands is one thing. Buildable lands doesn't provide the infrastructure to support that growth. The two different discussions, unfortunately. In other words, when, when, when you say we're gonna sign up for this much growth, nobody throws uh, transportation money our way, none. Nobody throws education 
money to the Peninsula School District, okay? None, okay? And by the way, to meet this demand, we just built, built, built one new, all new, and one heavily modified new elementary school. So keep that in mind. When you look at transportation, look at our transportation improvement project list, look at our TIF list, okay? We got a lot of stuff to do, okay, in terms of infrastructure just to support what we got, let alone incremental. So uh, I keep talking about a, uh, uh, an 800 unit credit as also providing what I would call a breather to our wild growth rate. We, we, I don't think we can sustain the type of growth that we've had uh, going forward or anything even near it. Okay. When you look at transportation, when you look at our infrastructure, uh, you, can, you can say, well, we'll tax the living daylights out of them on sewers and storm sewers and water and a few other things. Not really. So it's more than just buildable lands. Okay? You have to be able to support the, the population that you've got or you will have. Uh, in addition to just saying, well, I got enough land to build enough houses. It's, it's, it's well beyond that. So I tried to get a, an even further look at this thing. And uh, uh, I looked at Pierce County's population growth target. Okay. And their target, starting with a base population of 2020 of about 265,000. Uh, that they have to grow, I'm sorry, the base of 900,000, they have to grow by 265,000, which comes out about 29.4% as a county that we, that the county has to build from, from 2020 to 2044. Uh, and by the way, this is, just happens to be a magic number. Uh, I ran a regression analysis of all of the major cities that were tasked with growth uh, objectives from 2020 to 2044. That 0.29 number, it rings true all over the place. Basically what it is, it's a, it's a cross the board objective is what it is. I also found out that the, um, the projected or required growth is directly related to the population base that you're building from. They're just taking a straight percentage. And the correlation analysis showed that, by the way, I had a correlation coefficient of 98%, which is most people be dancing on the ceiling with that number. Uh, it's, it's true. Depending on how you start, what you start from, you take 29% of it, and boom, that's what your 2044 target would be. If you also take the, uh, the, the uh, start, start with that, it would say, okay, if we take that same 29.4% and apply it to Gig Harbor's numbers, we're starting with 11,343 people in 2020, okay? And that's a census number. Um, and basically multiply that by 0.294. That says we have to get 3,335 people incrementally here by 2044. At 2.3 occupants per dwelling unit, okay, you'd take that 335 and divide it by 2.3. And it comes out, we need 1,450 dwelling units of growth between 2020 and 2044, which by the way, I'm coming at this thing from a different perspective, but guess what? It falls right in that range that we had before. Those numbers I was quoting before, where we made a guesstimate from one to 1.3. I think this is, this is the only analysis I've seen. Maybe there's another one hiding out there that I'm not aware of, where we've I actually got, I've actually got some logic that goes with this thing. <laughs> if you if you take this and you do this and you analyze it this way and I've got supporting backup data on each on each step, uh, then this 1,450 dwelling units kind of jumps out as a, a reasonable target. If we do that, 
okay, and include an 800 unit carry forward credit for overachieving our 2010 to 2020, this thing drops down to 650 dwelling units will be required incrementally in Gig Harbor from 2020 to 2044. Huge. This, this has a huge um, uh, impact. And, and I know some people will say, well, this is unreasonable. What's unreasonable relative to what? <laughs> okay. I, I think if you follow the logic here, and uh, hopefully everybody does, um, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and in my concluding remark, like I said, this 650 dwelling units, first of all, I think it's fair. We started with a standard haircut. Everybody got the same 29% objective. Uh, it's the logic, I think, fits together in the 2020 to 2044 growth target generation. But I think it's also, as I mentioned before, going to provide us with some breathing room uh, on supporting infrastructure and services while still trying to retain our character. Okay. So that, that's it in, in summary. Uh, what, where I'm going with this thing, and what I'd like to do is uh, I would like to empower our team, which has been Carl and Katrina going forward uh, to basically uh, uh, emphasize this and support this and, and basically say, yeah, this is a reasonable thing to do. I'd also like to get the full council behind this thing. And by the way, this is, it's, it's huge. This is, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything so far in my three and a half years here that, that comes close to this one, okay, in terms of the impact going forward. Uh, this, will, this will have an impact well after we're off council or we're in our current position or whatever. This is a huge, huge deal. And having lived with um, uh, the shortfalls, particularly in the infrastructure over the last few years. And by the way, I did not stage the traffic jam today to support my position on this, although it, it is somewhat serendipitous. Uh, uh, I'm sure I'll get a lot of support. Uh, uh, I, I think we're all in agreement that we are um, uh, behind the eight ball in terms of catching up. Okay, Public works is just overwhelmed right now. And it's more than just dollars. Uh, it's dollars, it's capability, it's heads, it's a whole series of things uh, trying to get things done. Uh, and I would say the same thing to some extent about parks that falls in that same category. So uh, with that, are there any questions? I think, uh, Jim, you got your hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, now that we got the recording going, uh, I, I just wanna thank Council Member Himes for the tremendous effort and uh, time that he's put into the subject over the last several months. It's, it's been phenomenal, Bob. Um, I, I don't know anybody else that could have pulled it off. And I really appreciated your analysis and how you came up with those numbers. I think it's valid. And I support your notion 100%. Thank you. Yes, Mayor Kuhn. Yeah, you're muted, I think. I agree Great. too, but we have to summarize it. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, this is, this, is, this to, was the long to, version. We don't want to lose them. So we have to summarize it to where like, well, one thing that stood out is you said, we basically have to build a thousand plus homes in the next 30 years or so to, to meet the criteria that we have to, and we're way past that, we will be. So yeah. I think we need to get the most impact. We have to summarize that in, in very chosen words to get the most impact. But I agree yeah. with everything you're saying. Yeah, I, I took the long route. And by the fact, this is the reason I brought it to this group, because uh, this is way beyond the attention span of a typical council member, okay, in terms of trying to sell this. So yeah, I, I think we got to sanitize this for sure. Uh, in terms of um, being able to grasp what's going on here. Okay. Uh, let's see, Katrina, you had your hand up. 
Thank you. Um, I, I really, Council Member Himes and I had a really long, very good conversation about growth in the numbers. And so I wanna thank Council Member Himes for that, um, for that discussion. I wanted to mention a couple of other items that we discussed, um, several ideas that we had moving forward. Um, I wish Council Member Cranich was here to maybe he's listening. Well, I'm here. I was just, uh, I just okay. saw something crazy going on outside my window. Oh, okay. Well, you do, you do have the construction there today, right? Um, so uh, three things that I mentioned to Council Member Himes, just that I want to mention to the committee today are, um, I, and I really appreciate the analysis that Bob um, has put together, and I, as he mentioned, I think it does align with the one to 1.3 percent growth that Carl and I presented um, earlier this year. But there are three recommendations that I would like to professionally make to the city regarding growth, um, just for you to keep on the back or front of your mind. Number one would be to look back at what caused this. And by this, I mean the, the overreaching of the targets. How did we get here? What, what items do we not have in our comp plan or our code um, that would have, have some effect on this? And I'm speaking of this from a, a policy perspective from, from a, a, what council can affect. Um, and, and Bob and I, had the discussion about, you know, credits and, you know, how we're going to approach this. And I do think that approaching it, you know, regionally proactively as Carl and I have from a staff perspective, probably the best way, you know, we haven't given in and given a percentage or a number, you know, we really do have been towing the line for a year and a half saying we want to have this process, we want to have the data before we give numbers. And I think that's important. Um, as an example, one of the items that the city's code um, does not have that could benefit uh, this discussion would be most jurisdictions do not allow plat documents to come in as a complete application unless the rezone has already been completed. Um, another example would be development agreements that a uh, or any other type of kind of incentive zoning would not be able to occur if there was not adequate capacity or demand, excuse, no, you're right, capacity within um, the jurisdiction already. So essentially a council couldn't come in and approve a development agreement for 500 units if we didn't have 500 units of uh, capacity within the city already. And again, this is to ensure and it's one of the fundamental aspects of growth management is we need to ensure that our, what we're allowing for growth, that we can both accommodate it um, in terms of our utilities and our schools. Um, it allows us to plan for growth, essentially. And so that gets to what Council Member Himes was talking about in terms of, you know, our heightened um, park needs, our heightened street needs. You know, all of these things fit together. When we adopt a comp plan, we adopt a total number of dwelling units and a total number of people. And with that, it's how community development and public works work together on how um, large our sewer treatment plant is going to be, how our intersections are going to function. And when decisions on growth are made outside of that plan, it, it puts things out of whack and then we're not necessarily planning for it. So. Um, number one would be to look back what happened. Number two would be to suggest some amendments um, into the future. And then the third to wrap up my comments would be to really get involved regionally at PCRC as well as PSRC. Um, Council Member Himes has illuminated a problem that Pierce County has been noting uh, about other cities for a long time. And that is that they're not, certain cities are not taking their share of growth, uh, namely the metro cities, Tacoma, Everett, um, Bremerton, Seattle is, is to some extent, but 
when those areas don't accommodate the housing needs, then the smaller cities start to receive a lot more pressure. And so regionally, I would recommend that we get a council member on uh, potentially a small city rep at the PSRC executive committee to talk about um, how the growth plan affects small cities. I'm not sure that our voice is heard. Um, the second thing, and uh, Tony and the mayor and I met with um, representatives from Pierce County to discuss our urban growth area and development going on within the urban growth area, kind of extending a, a we're putting a little something in their mind about a potential urban growth area management agreement in the future. Uh, and that, so that's something else that I would just put on the council's radar is a lot of growth in the UGA is attributed to the city, even though it's not ours, take Clinton 38th, for example. So, you know, how can we work regionally to ensure that the people who are supposed to be accommodating in those population are, and how can we work with Pierce County to better manage our urban growth area that will eventually be city? Thank you for listening to my thoughts. Okay, other comments? Yes, Mayor Kuhn. You're muted, uh, you can unmute. I see what council has there to go through. <laughs> um, right. It's a little bit on the same line. You know, Katrina and I met, and I think uh, Carl was there. We met with uh, Pierce County, with Derek Young. And we said we were concerned of the growth that was happening in the UGA and that we weren't getting um, included in, in, in a lot of those plans with um, count per trips. So like the Tacoma, um, Tacoma Screw or all sorts of buildings that were not being included. And so yet they're gonna pass through our city and we're not, um, we're not getting that trip count for impact fees as well. Uh, we're not even being considered with, you know, the 38th and Hunt, um, the clear cut there, or, or, or plumbing standards or building standards. So they don't follow our building standards, whatever they, you know, however they're different, but then later they're going to be part of our, they're going to be annexed in. And we were actually told um, that the executive director of Pierce County is very aggressive and wants to really do a lot of building and that we will not be included. It's just not going to happen that they are not going to let us weigh in on that because they would, I kind of see one little part of it um, span away or any of these other UGAs for other cities. They don't want to have a different set of standards for all their codes. So they don't want cities to weigh in on their UGAs because then they'd be, they'd have all these interpretations that they'd have to, um, uh, Abide by. I understand mm -hmm. that, but I'm letting this group know we're not getting, we're not going to be getting a lot of support from Pierce County as far as letting us be involved in any of the codes or regulations or development in their UGA. So Katrina can add to that, but that just shows how much of a threat we've got around us. Mm -hmm. I think yes. that there's a definite opportunity for us to partner with Pierce County, you know, in particular, once we start seeing the results of our urban growth area analysis, looking at some of the fiscal uh, impacts of either annexing or not annexing some of the UGA, there'll be some policy opportunities for our council to decide do we want portions of the UGA in it in or not anymore. Um, and so I think we do have that um, coming to the table with Pierce County. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of work to do. Yes, Council Member Frenich. Well, hasn't it in fact, I thought that we've had a pretty good working relationship with Pierce County. Seemed that, that it, at least in the past it was where they did take uh, some of our concerns into consideration when they were making land use decisions. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think that uh, from a staff perspective, we have a, a great working relationship with Pierce County. I know they just hired a new planning and public works director uh, and she's great. I look forward to establishing a relationship with her. 
Derek um, and his staff member were very open to hearing what, um, what we had to say. I think specifically what the mayor was getting at, Mayor, if I may, is uh, the mayor was speaking specifically about tree retention. For instance, the 138th property, if that was developed under our standards, it would have had a buffer, right? And so the mayor was talking about how do we, you know, how do we enter into those so those projects can be reviewed under certain standards that the city would want. And what, what we did here is that the county executive um, likely would not be supportive of that. And because of the um, form of government could veto code amendments at, to the, that effect. So I think we may have support on the council side um, and we may need to talk more on the executive level uh, about that. Right, well, you know, unfortunately tree retention is, you know, I'm a big fan of tree retention and I support it hundred percent. There are so many loopholes around it with you take out the middle trees and the, now these are danger trees. We got laminated root rot here. So, you know, that that's, can be a real problem. But I guess getting back to um, Council Member Himes' um, comments earlier. Um, so Carl, is it true that, um, and I, I know it's true that these, these other jurisdictions that have not been meeting, they didn't meet their 2020 targets. So, are they, are, are they, since they didn't achieve those, are, is everybody starting with a clean slate or are those getting added on to their 2020 to 2024 or 2044 numbers? Or um, Carl's gone, I guess, so it's. Yeah, uh, Carl had to, had to leave for the day. Um, so the, the buildable lands report does have teeth in that it looks at the, it looks at each zone, for instance, if you're, they're meeting their density or not meeting their density, um, and reasonable measures must be established. However, right, right. If, the, if the target was not met, that does not stack on to the following. And, okay. that, and, that, and that gets to the discussion that we've had about why we can't bank per se, um, our growth, but we can make the case of why we want to grow at a lower rate, which I think the city has done. But well, just like we don't get to bank it, they don't have to stack it. Well, rather than, than, than belaboring the, the whole point, uh, I'll just reiterate that I, I completely, I appreciated Bob's analysis. I completely support it. And I do think it needs to come before the full council. And, and I know that you know, you may not be able to make it happen at uh, PCRC, but um, I, I think we really, the, they're, they're very valid points, especially in light of the way you answered the second question that these underachievers aren't getting, the, those numbers aren't getting add on, added on to their 20, 20, 20, 44 numbers. So that's an injustice in, in and of itself. So. Um, and I would also like to, to thank staff again for including council in this discussion, uh, long, very detailed discussion that we've been having all year on this because, uh, you know, I, I wasn't on the planning and building committee before, but I don't ever remember hearing anything about under the old administration council being included at this level of discussion. So I, I very much appreciate it. And I think the citizens very much appreciate it. And I think we're by us doing this, the councilmen and women being involved here, I think we're doing um, our citizens a, a very good service. So I, I really, really appreciate all of this, every, everything that's gone into this so far. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilman Markley. Thank you. Yes, I I would echo what Councilmember Franish just said. Um, it's this is a really confusing subject. I admit for for me to try to keep track of all this. So the staff's help and support and explanations of all of these things has been really really beneficial. And um, also a huge thank you to Councilmember Himes. You're going to have some big shoes to fill coming up. I uh, will temporarily fill them and then I'm gonna 
I'm going to ask for a council person to step in. So <laughs> council member Franage, you know, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I like to think that I study pretty well and I'm pretty up to date on this, but, uh, I, I, I don't think there's any replacing council member Himes, uh, intelligence yeah. and dedication and willingness to put this in because this is, this is a phenomenal, what, what he's done, any other council members that, that, that aren't on this committee, they have, they could have no idea or even grasp what Bob has done. It, it is, you know, like I say, I think I'm pretty well studied and I, I know that I probably couldn't have pulled it off. So, um, yeah, you know. it's going to take a, a special kind of special kind of person to, re to, to replace, replace that and, and, um, and hopefully we will get somebody with the same passion for this and and the same drive to go out and do similar to, you know to what councilmember Himes has done and and I'm looking forward to trying to work you know create as many partnerships as possible with the people that can actually affect change and can actually help us deal with this issue um whether that's at the executive level or this county council level, you know, whatever needs to, to happen there. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad Katrina, that you're going to be establishing a relationship with the new planner over, over at the county and just hoping to work, you know, as closely as we can with our representatives and, you know, anybody that, that needs to be involved in making sure that other, other people are taking big bites of this pie that they're supposed to be taking and we're not having to swallow the whole thing. So, um, so yeah, thank you to staff. Thank you to council member Himes, you know, and, and to the mayor and to mayor Kuhn for allowing us to talk about this because this is really important. And the entire council does need to know what, what is going on with this. This is, you know, this is for our future generations to come. So we need to really, um, really keep, keep up on this. And so just thankful, thankful for all of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, one thing I would emphasize, and this is the, uh, <laughs> the thought process I went through. Literally, I asked myself, why am I worrying about this? If, if everybody else is missing their target and the end of the world hasn't happened, why am I worrying about this? It's crazy. Okay. Why, why am I spending my time on this? Uh, and the answer I came back with is, well, hey, I, I think it should be done this way. I think it should be done in a logical fashion. I think it should be accurate. I think it should be defendable. And, and, and one of the key items is even though we may feel or certain people may feel this is bad news with us coming in and saying, hey, uh, we think there's a, a, a lower number that's, that's reasonable, it's defendable, is I would argue from a standpoint of authenticity by the way, I, I don't know how many of these other entities said <laughs> the ones that are at 27% or less came in and said, no, we can't do that. That's impossible. Okay. Or, or absolutely refused to accept that as a target. Okay. I, I don't know how many there were. Okay. But uh, I, I would argue that, hey, we are, I think, coming forward with to our best, the best of our knowledge, the truth. Hey, this is, this is what's. By the way, this happened to us. This, this isn't just some story that we're dreaming up. This actually happened to Gig Harbor. And we have paid dearly over the last three and a half years that I've been in, uh, trying to put through all the corrections to fix these things of sudden growth. I mean, and by the way, we can attribute this to, and by the way, in, in, a, in what I would call an, a non-accusatory fashion, for example, I don't think anybody would have guessed that the Great Recession was going to happen uh, about the same time the second span of the bridge opened up, about the same time that interest rates uh, on mortgages and stuff hit an all-time low and maintained that low over the period we're talking about. Everything here, and, and there were some, what I would call some um, expansive legislation pieces that went through, some of which we took out three years ago, okay? 
But I think when you look at it in total, it says, yeah, this, this was a moment in time when everything just exploded, okay? And it exploded kind of after the fact, okay? If, if you had said in 2009, this place is gonna go crazy, um, say five to uh, uh, 12 years from now, I don't think you would have gotten very many takers on that, okay? Uh, so I can, I can understand what happened, okay? At least I, I can get my arms around it. But uh, to not, uh, let's say, look to the future with some level of credibility uh, that we can actually do what we say we're going to do or passively agree to something that we know is not on the cards, uh, I, I think we're doing a disservice to the county and we're doing a disservice to ourselves. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at in this whole thing. And, and uh, I've never been bashful when uh, trying to pitch what I think is the truth. So uh, that's right where I'm at. Council Member Himes, uh, we are at 5.07 and um, need to wrap up our meeting. Okay, we will do that. Uh, okay, with that in mind, I would like to, to get this in front of the whole council and uh, at least get agreement that, yeah, hey, this is, a, this is this is understandable, number one, and I can, I can truncate it, okay? And by the way, I, I don't have a problem with a uh, council meeting, I don't have a problem with a study session, anything's fine with me, just getting it in front of them so that they understand, you know, where, the, where we are and where this thing is heading and where it should be heading, at least from my perspective, um, to make this a, a, a fair, accurate, doable type situation. So uh, I'll truncate right there. Jim, one last final comment. Here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, two very short ones. So the, the one thing, you know, when we're all these numbers get talked about and allocations and in different jurisdictions, the one thing that you can't quantify is desirability. And yeah. so we are in a very desirable place. So, um, you know, that, that's just something I had written down here. So am I to understand, um, Mayor and, and Katrina, that um, because I'm supportive and I don't know, can't speak for Councilman Markley, that uh, Council Members Himes analysis gets before the council and can get a thumbs up or thumbs down on whether or not the, the council feels that that is something that they would like staff to really bring forward when the next time this negotiation goes on with the county. So this is, it brings up a good point and Council Member Himes and I had this discussion. As I mentioned, his analysis, although it's done differently, is very consistent with the numbers that Carl and I have previously brought forward to this group. Um, we are looking at bringing forward the growth targets to the council as soon as possible um, once we have the buildable lands report. And that's kind of been our consistent message to this committee for maybe four months now. We did just receive the final, final, final draft of the buildable lands report today. We've not had a chance to dive into that. Carl's coming off of a, a week's vacation. Um, I would prefer, um, and I'm going to request to talk to the mayor and Tony about this. I would like this to come forward. Um, I think it would be better for the public and for the council as a whole if this came forward in tandem with the staff analysis and with council member Himes um, analysis. Again, they're very consistent. I think that some of the discussion is, maybe that we're going to have a fight, you know, coming down to, you know, one to 1.3%. I don't think that that's the case. I think we've taken direction from this committee for the past year on wanting to reduce our, um, our percentage. And I think that Carl and I have um, advocated that way regionally. And um, so I think my preference would be to come forward with this in tandem and definitely have council member Himes as a you know, an expert on the council, um, you know, provide his analysis. I think it would be better public process having it come together at once, which likely could happen in October or November. 
if we did it in tandem and we waited till let's say November, could we, could, do we have any um, time to influence what I would call the, the, the first round on this thing? My, my fear is Pierce County will get locked in and say, these are the numbers. They've done a lot of work on it and we don't want to change it because if we change this, then we got to change a whole bunch of other things. I'd, I'd, no. rather, I'd rather get in on the ground floor and say, hey, here's something that we've looked at. Uh, this is why we feel the way we do. Uh, we think it's fair. We think it's justifiable. Um, and at least get our oar in the water, trying to turn this freighter around when it's already, you know, miles down the, down the, down the, cro down the course here. I think it's going to be a very, very tough thing. Um, <laughs> That's, that is one of the things that I do want to dispel. There's no freighter that's going down the river. You know, we've done, we have been participating in this regionally and we have taken Dick Harbor's growth rate down. Have we settled on one? No. And the main answer for that is we don't know what our capacity numbers are. And that's because the, the Buildable Lands Report was due in June and we don't have it yet. Um, and so that is the additional information that we need. We did just talk to the principal planner. I did last week, um, Dan Cardwell, who's in charge of the staff working on the buildable lands report and also the growth targets. And we told them, hey, we're not giving you a number still. And there's more and more of the small cities that are kind of jumping on the bandwagon with us. You know, this is a cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not even 2022 yet. And, you know, there's still time. And so Pierce County has begrudgingly um, come around to that fact. One of the other things that is going to buy us some time, just to give you a little preview of things coming to PCRC potentially, is the core cities within Pierce County are in severe disagreement with Vision 2050 numbers. Um, way under. They do not want to accommodate anywhere near the population that the four cities are expected to. And so the big thing for me um, from, from my role here is I don't want to lose, you know, I don't want to be focusing so much on this, which I do feel that we have control over. And again, I do believe it's consistent with your analysis and lose sight that the four cities want to underdevelop. And how is that, how is that action? regionally going to affect the smaller cities, right? Because from a PSRC level, we have a Pierce County number. And so how is that gonna happen? So, you know, more of my effort is going to be to ensure that the core cities are taking their share, right? As we just talked about, um, accommodating their growth that they're supposed to take and that it doesn't flow down or flow so there's still a lot of balls in the air. I don't think there's a freighter going down the river. I do think that this is a really great analysis. What is missing is the capacity information that we will be receiving very shortly. And I think with that, we can compare our capacity, both Bob, to your analysis, as well as the, what we've been looking at and come forward with a complete package um, of, hey, this is how we're going to address growth for the next 20 years. I, the, the, uh, I, I will just refer you back to my comments there relative to infrastructure and support. It's more than just buildable lands. And to me, that's, the, uh, that's a huge item. And I can do some research. I'll, I'll pull some of the tip and the tip list, the tip list, uh, the parks list, all the lists, all, all the things that we're doing to just to, to accommodate what we've already built in many cases, let, let alone what we haven't built. And, uh, uh, and, and there's some biggies in there, by the way, some huge ones in there. Uh, for example, if, if uh, the closure of, uh, of uh, Harborview Drive from, for four days can cause this mayhem that I just saw <laughs> up at, up at uh, uh, the Vernon Borgen Canterwood roundabout. Uh, that's one where we've talked about the, the signaling 
the, the metering system uh, for a long, long time, which has to be in conjunction, by the way, with the, with wash dot. But that only buys us a certain amount of time. We're also looking, by the way, in these kind of numbers, I think we're also looking at some things that we, it's not in the six year plan. Why? Because we hope it's further out. Okay, and it probably is. But um, some of the things that are in there, okay. Uh, and I know Ken Malich has often talked numerous times, called we need a major route to get to the east to the Crescent Valley. We've only got one right now. It's called through Gig Harbor. And we've streamlined that as best we can with the work that we're doing on Stinson. The day is coming with this, if we have to accommodate these bigger numbers, you're, you're, we're going to have to do it. That's all there is to it. There'll be, there'll be no alternative at that point. So I, I want to stress it's more than just buildable lands. Okay, That's just the starting point of this discussion. The, uh, remember, Hans, I didn't mean to imply that and I don't remember saying anything that it was just about buildable lands. What I was saying is the buildable lands report is going to come out and we will have the capacity information yeah. within uh, that. But, and, and I would agree with that. And that's I, I would agree. That's that, that's fine. But, that's fine. But, but, but I don't capacity think, again. I, numbers I are a separate issue from the credit. Much. I think we really do want to at least at least you know express our view, get our cards on the table, and and it shouldn't be in a in a in a uh, offensive way. Let me put it that way. It's just hey, this is what we're looking at. Okay, this is what we see, and uh, and I don't think anyone. It's presented in that one manner. I don't think anybody can argue with this. Okay, they can say, well, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that, but blah 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 blah. And I don't think it's going to do any damage. I think silence right now is more damage than that. Uh, Councilmember French. Well, yeah, that, that's why. And thank you for telling us that there's this consternation going on among the core cities because that's makes it even more problematic. Where the you know what can start running downhill to the smaller cities, yeah. I guess the populations. But uh, I think that I really don't want to lose sight. And I understand you said you want to bring them in tandem together, but I think the sooner that we coalesce around, if we can coalesce, the majority of the council and the mayor can support council members Himes' notion about we need to we need to push for these credits. The sooner we start that ball rolling, uh, to me, the better off we're gonna be at the end in, in trying to make it uh, a reality. So I'll leave it at that. I know it's 20 after, so. Okay. Um, I think we're well past our five o'clock quitting time. 4.30 so, quitting time. Pardon? 4.30 quitting time. Oh, 4.30, uh, okay, okay. Well, we. We, we, uh, we, we debated the, the first topic too long, I think. <laughs> that's just my opinion. Anyway, that's BMBs. Uh, anyway, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn if we are at this point, this juncture? Move to adjourn. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And, uh, and, and think seriously about a either a very near term study session or council meeting when we can bring this topic forward. At least we need to lay it on the table, okay? And see yeah. where everybody else is, is coming out on this view. We're gonna need to do a study session, you know, between now and mid-October. So that sounds like a great topic to do. Okay. All right, okay. Thanks Thank you all. very much. Thank you.